I, cha I changed the name of my presentation. <laughs> no, this is the real name. Uh, exploring the depth of madness through QGIS symbology. Uh, my name is Niall Dawson. I'm going to be up and down a couple of times today, so sorry if you get sick of seeing my face up here. Um, two second background. I am a GIS developer slash analyst. I, if you go back in my history, I've been a GIS user for a long time. Um, my passion is maps. I love maps that look really nice. Um, and I love cartography, so that's kind of how I got started in GIS. And it's still one of the main, the main things that I love about maps is when they look nice. Um, I personally think one of QGIS's great strengths is in its symbology and its cartographic abilities. Uh, and over time, it's kind of, that's really developed and, and built up. And there's this whole almost community of people who love pushing it to the extreme and seeing exactly how far you can take what's available in QGIS uh, in terms of the cartographic tools and just go absolutely wild and push it in ways that nobody has ever thought of before in terms of getting different map outputs. Some of it's practical, some of it's not so practical. Today, we're going they're not so practical. But, <laughs> but hopefully, I'm also going to dissect some of these things that I do. So there is takeaways that you might be able to take away and go back and say, hey, when I'm making that map, that technique might be useful. Uh, up front, I'm just going to say, so this is done entirely using QGIS symbology. So just clicking the buttons that are there. There's no kind of Python plugins or, or trickery kind of happening behind the scenes. It's all just using what's available in your layer styles and in your label styles. So we're going to push it to the extreme. No Python, no plugins. Uh, quick warning up front, there's some flashing lights in this presentation, so if that's an issue, just be warned. Uh, my other thing is that it, it relies on QGIS 3.0, so, so please don't crash on me. Uh, <laughs> again, it's already done it once today. Uh, I'll give some credits up front. So some of the artwork in this thing I've taken from a fantasy fight game, so credit to them. Um, and I also want to give credit to Matteo Pellerin from uh, Cambodia, who has worked quite closely with me on some of these techniques and is also a QGIS core developer who does a lot of uh, cartographic improvements as well. So this is a bit of a storyline to this uh, presentation. Here's our GIS explorers going out there battling the demons of GDA 2024, or 2020. <laughs> I feel like my brain exploded from that presentation, and this was the result. So let's take it across to QGIS now, and we're going to see how well they go trying to unlock the mysteries of these new projections and what it actually means for them. QGIS 3.0. So we're going to start our story in this sleepy little town here. It all looks very nice and peaceful. Um, in fact, it actually looks a bit too peaceful, so I'm going to just make it a little bit more stormy here. I'm going to add some clouds to this. Let's make it a bit more moody. Yeah, that looks a bit nicer. Actually, no, nah, we want to make it a bit more stormy. I'm going to add some lightning here as well. Here we go. I'm just turning on layers on and off here to make these effects. Um, and let's put my title page up. There we go. Did anyone think you could do that in QGIS, just using symbols? Uh, <laughs> do you want to see how it's done? Yeah? yeah? Do you want to see the secrets behind it? Um, let me undo these changes I've made. And I'll, I'll rip this project apart so you can see how this was done. So to start with, uh, Hopefully you can see on the screen, let me know if the, the writing's too small and I can copy and paste it into something bigger. Um, the, the very bottom layer I've got here is just a simple polygon. If I change it across to um, like one of the standard styles here, all it is is a, a big box there. I have used what's called this a raster image fill here. Um, so a raster image fill style basically lets you pick a JPEG or a TIFF or something like that and instead of just filling in that polygon, the rectangle polygon with a solid colour, it's just put that picture there. So that's, that's my background layer. Uh, on top of that I had this, this clouds layer. So the clouds layer is when I could go in here and I could add a few points 
and they become these, these kind of moving clouds that slowly appear and shift across my map. Um, this is actually just a point layer. If I go back and I change it again to just a, a normal style, there's just a bunch of points in that layer. But there's a couple of tricks that are kind of happening behind the scenes which actually make these move and, and change appearance. Um, one of these is available from, I can't remember, Q just 2.16 maybe. Um, and that is if I go into my, my layer properties, this looks a little bit different in 3.0, but it's, um, it is there in two point something. Uh, there's a bunch of fields in this, in this clouds point layer. So there's one here for size, for instance, for speed, for a cloud number. Um, and they're actually populated using default values. So if I go in here and I click on, for instance, the speed, down here at the bottom, it, this, this field has a default value expression put in there. Um, if I bring this up, so that, that says, sorry? Uh, it says attributes, attributes form. This looks a little bit different in 3.0. In um, version 3, in version 2, this is under the fields tab. Um, but in 3.0, it's been rearranged a bit to be a bit more nicer. Um, so my expression here, if I copy this and put it into Word or something, so you can, so you can see it. Yeah. So that's my expression. So basically, uh, Q just has this little expression engine where it allows you to do simple maths and, and well, not so simple anymore, but um, you can do mathematical expressions and you can uh, manipulate values and that sort of stuff using the expression engine. This function gives a, a random number, the, the f means float, so it's a random uh, decimal number between 1 and 10. So every time I add a new cloud point, it's getting a, a speed value there as a random number between 1 and 10. Um, similarly, it's getting a size between 50 and 100, um, and a cloud is between 1 and 2, so it's either 1 or 2. And so as I add points into this layer, that attribute table just gets populated with a whole bunch of random values based on those kind of parameters I've set up. So that's the very first thing. The other thing is there's also a, a column here called epoch. So there's a function. The default value for that one is this epoch function. And that basically just returns uh, the number of milliseconds since some date in 1970, uh, the, the, the current epoch, which is that massive number, number of milliseconds since some reference time way back. Um, so as I'm adding them, they're all slightly different because the time had changed between the clicks. So you've got data modernization <laughs> 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 And the, the main reason that's doing it, it's basically like a seed value, it's so that each one gets a slightly different value. Um, if I go back to my, the proper styling for this, another thing that is important that I've used here, um, and is a new 3.0 feature, is this option to refresh the layer at an interval. So this was added in 3.0, is basically you can go in there and you can say, this layer I need to, to redraw it every X number of seconds. Um, this can be useful if you've got, for instance, uh, you, your data set might be changing. It might be a, a, a layer that's being generated by some sort of logger and you always want it to update every 10 seconds as the data, the new data comes in. Um, but in this case, I'm, I'm kind of abusing it and I'm telling QGIS to render this layer every 0.1 seconds. So 10 times a second, it's redrawing this layer. So, um, so that's the second piece of the puzzle here. The, the final piece is I have used um, a whole bunch of these data-defined overrides, they're called in QGIS, which are basically these little buttons that sit next to a whole bunch of all the symbol settings and all the label settings. They kind of look like the icon. I don't actually know what it is. It's, it's a little grey thing here when it's not enabled. Um, and when you when you know what it is, you actually see it. it's everywhere in QGIS. So all throughout labelling, all throughout symbology, in diagrams, in Composer, it's all there. Um, and what it actually lets you do is really tweak how those, those values are evaluated per feature. So by putting in here 
an expression for my image path for these clouds. So, so there's the, if I copy this, whoops, it's a bit too big. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the value for the picture path for those clouds. But when I go back into this, the, the little expression button here, if I go in here, it's actually got an expression here that says, take the first bit, so this images slash cloud small, put on that random number between one and two that was generated from my default value. So it's either cloud1.png or cloud2.png, just based on that random number when I clicked and actually digitized that feature. So it means that even my clouds look one way or they look slightly different, just depending on those, the, the image that it randomly gets gen uh, assigned. Similarly, this, um, the image width, I'm actually telling it to get from an expression which is that size column, and I'm dividing it by 400. I can't remember why I did 400, but it just looked nice. Um, so each cloud is actually sort of a random size there. The trick to making the move is I've used, uh, again, an expression to tell my symbol that it's offset. So in Q, just there's this offset control. If I go back to a, a normal symbol, um, I'll turn off this for a second. So, so this symbol offset basically lets you push the symbols one way or another from where that point is actually digitized. Um, what I am doing here, if I go back a few steps, back to my nice one, is I'm telling QGIS that my offset is actually taken from this horrible expression, which looks like this, um, and it's taking that, that epoch, so the number of milliseconds when that feature was recorded, comparing it to the current epoch, so it can basically work out a length of time that that render is, is occurring since I digitized that feature, and that means the offset will, will increase slowly over time as that, as that time difference increases. Um, and it's also doing some stuff here, so it's basically saying push it along, then reset it. So it can go as far as um, a certain tolerance and it goes back to the start. There's also a what's called an expression variable here. These little things with an at in front of them are called variables. And in QGIS, they're, they're quite powerful because they, oh, they well, I won't get into that right now, but, um, but if I actually go in here, my, my variables are set up in the project properties, um, and you can see, if it's not too small, there's one here for wind speed, so I could actually go in here and I could say, let's make my wind a bit faster, and let's say it's 0 0.0006, and all of a sudden my clouds start moving a little bit quicker because it's being multiplied by a bigger value. So that's how we've got that nice moving cloud effect. The, the next layer I put on was the lightning one. This one's actually quite simple. So lightning is, if I switch back to a simple symbol, all it is is a big, big polygon square there. Um, I am, I'm just giving it a white fill. So it's a big white polygon fill. But I'm using the rule-based renderer. So rule-based renderer basically lets you put a little expression in there to say these features are only rendered if they match, if they pass for a certain this rule. And so my all the magic comes down to this expression here. Uh, so hopefully it's not too small. But basically what it's doing is it's choosing a random number every time that fra that that layer is being rendered, which is ten times a second. And if that random number is is less than a certain threshold, then show that polygon or not. So basically flash, 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 and then it stops for a while. Um, and that gives it that kind of lightning effect there. The very last thing in here was my, my title slide, which switches on only when I digitize a point in that layer. Uh, and then it does this kind of animated fading appearance. That is done through a bunch of uh, of rule-based labeling. So just like rule-based symbology lets you control whether a feature is rendered based on an expression, rule-based labeling, you can have label rules depending on whether or not it passes an expression. And I'm going to be covering that in my workshop a bit later. Um, but basically, this is just rendering different parts of that text, so the different lines. Um, and the expression is saying, only switch that line on after a certain number of milliseconds has passed since I first 
digitize the point in that layer. So wait until I've digitized the point in that layer and then after a certain number of milliseconds, each of those rules will turn on or off and that those points will slowly, those, those lines of text will appear. Um, and I've also used a, an expression here for the opacity for those, which gives it that nice sort of fade in appearance. So basically as the time increases since I digitized it, the opacity goes from, from zero to 100%. So that's my first project. Now we'll go to stage two. Nine minutes. Nine minutes, that's cool. Um, right, stage two. So we imagine that we've, we've escaped the storm in our hometown. Now, <laughs> now somehow we've got to Venice. I don't know why I've got to Venice, but that's where our mystery led us. Um, and it's come down to a, a showdown between us and the evil superpowers, and it comes down to a game of noughts and crosses, because that's how... <laughs> Because that's how all great battles are decided. Um, so we can play Q just noughts and crosses in this project. And if I make this markers layer editable, I can add a few points in here. Let's say like this. Oh, there we go, player one, one. Let's reset and try again. Oh, now, player one, one again. Um, and this is all done again through Q just symbology. Do you want to see how this one's done? Yeah. All right, let's reset this and I'll show you. So if I pull this project apart again, we've got a background layer, that's nothing special. Uh, the first thing I want to show is this, this board that we've got here, our, our little crosshatch lines there. Um, the way that's done is it's actually just a, all it is is a line layer. So I've got, um, a layer with six lines, four lines, yeah. <laughs> four, <laughs> four line features in there. Um, and the, the niceness of it all comes through just how I've set up the symbols on that. So what I'm using here is a marker line. So if you don't know, a marker line basically lets you take a line feature and it's rendered by drawing a marker symbol at a certain interval along that line. So uh, in this case, it's drawing it every, every three millimeters. It's drawing my little marker, which is a, a triangle shape. Um, but it's not, you can see as you look at that, that's not a yellow triangle every three millimeters. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm actually using again an expression, so a data defined override for my size. Um, but I'm taking advantage of a, a new feature or a, a kind of a feature that was in version two but has been um, made better to good English here, yeah, um, in, in version three, which is that certain ones of these data-defined controls actually have what's called an assistant sitting behind them. So in version 2.x, I don't know when, 2.14 or something, um, these assist assistants were added for size. Uh, in 3.0, they've been expanded a whole lot, so they're a whole lot more powerful and they're in a whole lot more places. But if I go to my assistant for the size of these individual markers drawn along that line, um, what it's actually doing here is it's taking a little variable called, let's make that a bit bigger, um, the, the geometry point number. So as it's, as it's rendering those, those dots along the line, this variable increases by one um, for each of those dots. It's just the thing that Q just does internally and it exposes that information as this variable called geometry point number. You can actually see in the, in the help over here, it gives you a bit of an explanation of all the variables that are available for this expression and what, they're, what they mean. So in this case, geometry point number is the current point number in the rendered geometries part. It's meaningful only for geometries and for symbol layers and set that variable. Um, so basically, this is increasing from, from one, two, three, four, five, as we go across there. Uh, and it's translating my assistant is telling that the values that come in will vary from zero to 100, and I want them to be mapped to sizes that go from, from three millimeters to five millimeters. Um, and it gives me a little bit of a preview down here to show, okay, an input value of 10 is gonna be this size, an output value of, uh, input value of 100 comes out that size. And as I tweak these values, you can see, first off, the preview's changing, so it's showing me um, the different mapping of, of input values to symbol size, but also the map itself is changing, so that kind of gives you that live preview. Um, 
A really cool thing in version 3.0 is it's also got this transform curves you can do. So if, you, if you're used to like Photoshop or GIMP or whatever, like those um, image editing ones, and you've seen curves, this is a similar sort of thing. And you can basically say, my input values can be mapped through this curve to get that out, those output values. Um, the assistant is also avail available for things like colors. So if I look in here, I've got a color assistant here, which is taking this uh, yellowy map and, and ma mapping those vertexes across to colors and that. And if I change this, I could, I will change the appearance of those, uh, those individual marker points. The last bit here that I really want to show you is I've also added, you can see it most clearly here, is uh, that kind of glow effect that, that comes around those lines. Um, that is done through what's called a layer effect. So it's all set up if I go to my symbol styling thing under layer rendering. Right down the bottom here is a checkbox that says draw effects and a button here that configures it. So my layer has got an outer glow effect um, applied to it. And if I switch this off, you'll see the difference that that makes. So, so without it on, it's just a, the markers. When I switch that on, it's actually doing this, this outer glow that's fading from, from a greeny color to nothing. Uh, and when I switch this back on, it's, it's actually quite subtle, the difference this makes when you see it on the background layer until you turn it off and then you see actually, no, it actually does make a huge difference having that there. Um, this is where we get to a practical thing. I've, I tend to use this technique a lot in my maps is if I've got roads and they're sitting on, or like I've got some sort of features sitting on an aerial image background and you wanna make them pop just a little bit more but you don't wanna draw attention to it by doing some you know, huge buffer or making them really wide. You can, do it, you can do an outer glow and just make it really, really subtle so that it's not obvious to someone when they first look at your map that, oh, I just put a glow on that and it looks weird. Um, but it draws, it makes them pop without dominating the map. So it's just a, like a little trick you can do. You pull it down so it's not noticeable until you switch it off and then you realize the actual difference that makes. Um, so that's that. We have in here as well, if I switch on some other layers. Again, this is a, the, the layer that switches on when I put my points in here. Oops. Oops. Let me reset my project because I don't know what I did this then. Uh, the, this line that shows here is basically just a rule-based one again, and it's using this absolutely horrible expression that, <laughs> that takes advantage of what's called like an aggregate function. So the aggregate function is looking at the points in my dot layer to calculate how many of them have an x value of this, how many of them have an x value of the middle column, how many of them have an x value of the right column, um, summing them up if there's like three of the points that have that same matching x value, then it's saying yes, it passes that rule or not. Um, it's pretty horrible and that was a, a bit of a collaborative development, that, that expression there. Um, but the end result is it's showing these lines based on if there's three points in that, in that sequence. All right, I'll show my last slide here. My last little project here that I want to show. Right, so we've beaten the powers of darkness and we've found our way to this mystical moor that's all smoky and nice. Um, if we explore inside here, we get to, we found our, I found a secret doorway that looks a little bit scary, but we think that maybe inside there the arcane secrets of GDA 2020 are hidden. So let's have a look. And there we go. <laughs> the, the, the Bible of datum transforms. Um, that's a little bit boring because <laughs> if we've got all this far, we want it to be a bit more, a bit more fancy. So let's add some more effects here. Yeah, there we go. We won. Uh, we got there. <laughs> um, really quickly, because I think I've only got a minute, I'll show you how this one's done. The a, a lot of this actually is is using similar techniques as we've already seen. Um, so I'm using, for instance, with my, let's reset this. Um, so my background picture, again, is a, is a raster image filling that square polygon. Um, and it's using an expression to say if, this one is actually a, a bit of a nicer demonstration of the aggregates. Um, this expression here is saying, Calculate the aggregate of the number of points in my part three layer 
um, and I want the count of that. So if the count is one, then show an image that has got one dot PNG. If it's got two points, show two dot PNG. Um, and as I add points to this, this point layer here, that expression is evaluating to a different picture, which is showing in the background there. Oh, no. Um, the rest of this layer, so this one again is using data to find things with that same trick we used before of, of having an epoch so that it can animate over time and offsetting the points and changing the color. Um, so here's some of the things we used here. So we've got the live layer effects, which can be really, really useful for making nice looking maps. Sorry, I'll just be one minute. <laughs> uh, told you not to let me talk or I'll talk all day. Um, data to find overrides can be really, really handy. And again, in my, my label workshop later today, we're going to go into a bit more of the practical ways that you can use those. But that's where like 90% of the power of QGIS symbology lies is in these data defined things. And they apply to, to symbols, to labels, to composer, and to a whole bunch of other things. We've got the symbol assistants, which were kind of expanded in version three, but were available in two. Data defined controls are in two, by the way, so that's all available now. Same with layer effects, you can, you can use those today. Um, transform curves, new in 3.0. Auto refreshing layers, you've got to wait for 3.0. Rule based symbology and labels, been there for ages, so you can go home and you can start using that sort of stuff to make nice looking maps. Default field values have been there for a couple of releases. Expressions have been there for ages, but every single release, they get made more and more powerful by adding we, we keep adding new functions to them so that you get more and more uh, features available through those expressions. Um, aggregates are in two, so they're available now. And just a, I just want to end with this slide. Um, <laughs> I think it sums it up nicely. <laughs> Thank you.